Ryan, where are you? Judy, I'm here. <laughs> what are you doing over there? Summer's here and the living is easy. <laughs> and you know what else is here? Another episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time and happy first week of summer. You know, we are out here at Drake 7Ds on Shoals Ferry Road and we're in their houseplant section and it is full of wonderful plants which also work very well for your patios at this time of year. You know, stop on down and get a plant for your patio for the summer and for your house next winter. But coming up on the show today, we will show you how to be friendly with bees. We'll also be showing you some chimes, chains and benches. But coming up first, misters. I am at Wright Irrigation in Vancouver with Cindy. And Cindy, you know, the heat of summer has returned. And you have a wonderful idea to keep us cool on our patios all sure, summer Sure, sure. So uh, mist and cool um, is a, a system to cool people. <laughs> on the porch type of thing or you might have seen them at beer gardens it's nice or at the fair they might have these cooling mm -hmm. um you know cooling it's stations that right. kind of thing so you can put that right at your own in your own home on your own porch or what have you um you can hang it on the umbrella on your patio yeah, cool. you know table or what have you um it's a super simple thing to do so after learning about drip systems from you and in-ground irrigation this is easy peasy this is easy peasy <laughs> there's really nothing to it so what do we do um, you're just going to hook it to your hose uh, you know to your hose faucet okay um it's a full full pressure system so you don't need a pressure reducer all right so because you need the pressure to make the really fine mist okay um you just hook this to your hose faucet um you're going to put put tubing um, into it so just press it in all right um, and then you go you can go as far as you want to get to wherever you need to go and then you start putting um, the actual emisters on all right um, so they just press in they're very easy to press in we don't have to use glue or anything no glue just push it in mm -hmm. then you just continue on um, using T's and then the final one would be a 90 all right um, then you can use um, little clamps with nails to tack it down. And just a little hammer tap? Just ham hammer it down. If you want, you can paint this after. You can paint all <laughs> the tubing after if you want to make oh, it nice. blend in a little bit better. You wouldn't, of course, um, do okay. the actual uh, mister, but, right, right. <laughs> but it, you know, it would blend in. Um, if you want, they've got, um, they've got these little straps that you can use to hang, hang the tubing from an umbrella. Nice. So, so they, they just, they the just clip on, mm -hmm. so that you can just put it put it around an umbrella. Um, that's pretty much it. Cindy, we love tips. So any tips about how to place these for really a good effect? Sure. You want to make sure that um, when you're putting it on your uh, along your porch roof or something like that, that you make sure that the the mister itself is hanging clear of any boards or what have you, so that otherwise it would it would hit the board and drip. You oh, know. So you it. want it to be. <laughs> hanging above it, you know, you know, uh, uh, tacked on above it. Um, other than that, you know, every few feet, but it's really up to you, All right. whatever you want. And there is a chart that you have. So if you need a cheat sheet, there is a chart that we could, mm -hmm. we can um, take and take home and make it a little more easy. Sure. And it is easy peasy. And this is a way that you could stay cool with your friends and family all summer. Just come on up to Vancouver to write irrigation, talk to Cindy and the staff and make a mister at your house this weekend. Take so, thanks so much. Thank you. So I am here with Angie and we are at the Backyard Bird Shop in Lake Oswego and Angie, you know, we all love our birds, we love the bird feeders, we love seeing them come and eat, but there's been a, a, a lot of frustration with like different rodents, rats and stuff that are not right. eating. So we're going to talk about that and you're going to give us some ideas on how we can help control that. Great. Let me show you a few things that we've got that are, will really be a big help in preventing seed from landing on the ground. Okay. Uh, which and is that what it causes mostly is because it falls to the ground? Right. So when seed accumulates on the ground, it'll draw in all kinds of vermin. Okay. Um, you know, rats, mice, um, squirrels, raccoons, and possums, actually. Wow. Okay. Um, so by preventing the seed from landing on the ground, you can really go ahead and feed birds and keep a clean area and prevent these sort of problems. 
Um, this right here is a, a tube feeder with a large tray on it. The yeah. large tray catches the seed that the birds drop. Um, and birds are a little bit messy. They, they do are. drop <laughs> seeds. They are. Um, you know, even the small birds can throw a lot of seed around. So this tray would be a big help in preventing anything from going on the ground. Uh -huh. um, also, the seed that you see here is out of the shell. Now, why would that be important? Having seed that's out of the shell uh, prevents the shells from dropping. The, the shell portion of a bird seed is useless to the birds. And so they're always going to throw that aside and drop it onto the ground. Okay. So by uh, feeding shellless seed, you really prevent any waste. That's because go the, on the rats ground. will eat the shells too then, The right? rats will oh, come up goodness. just because shells are on the ground. Wow. Um, and you'll find holes under underneath the feeders where they're taking those shells. Okay. And there's other options though here. There are. This is, if you've already got a, a feeder and you can't attach a tray, this is a screen um, that expands out and catches um, any seed that might drop. Oh. And the birds will actually hop up in here and eat the seed from the screen as well. Okay. And then what is this? This looks like peanuts almost in a <laughs> jar up here. What's that? This is a pecan feast log. This is a solid log of bird seed um, that has had all the shells removed and it's held together with a gelatin. And it's a really clean way to feed birds. Uh huh. And and that's the gelatin doesn't affect the bird at all. It just it helps doesn't. Hold it no, together. it just holds the seeds together. Um, and that log will stay solid. There, it comes in a larger size as well. And a lot of people will use that for vacation feeding. Okay, so this this is probably then the suet then is this similar is in that hold together thing, so it doesn't fly all over. Right. Well, suet is a fat cake, um, and and this is our own. It has insects in it, and it doesn't have any seeds in it. Oh. And so um, having no seed or any filler seed in suet um, will prevent a lot of the suet from dropping on the ground um, yeah. and the birds will consume more of it and so this is a really clean way of feeding birds. So you also have though there's a specific type of food that you can get. Tell me about these. Right. This is a hot meat. Um, this is a seed that is coated with hot pepper oil. It's actually a habanero oil uh -huh. and that is really unattractive to any mammal. So squirrels, rats, uh, raccoons, possums, nobody's going to want to eat this because of the heat yeah. that's on that seed. And if you've already got seed and you need to treat it, um, this is called flaming squirrel, and this will also work for rodents. Um, this you just coat your seed with, and this, this bottle will treat up to 30 pounds of bird seed. So both of these then are really a great idea to help, just as another step of deterring the, the unwanted mammals from coming and, and, and eating the bird seed. Right. If you've got a problem with them, this will be a good step in the right direction. Well, you know, we all love our birds and we want to see them happy and healthy and flying around our yard. But if the rats and squirrels are bothering you, go to uh, gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website. You can go to one of the stores, get all this information, and make sure your garden is beautiful for yourself and the birds. Thank you so much, Angie. Thank you. stages, 22 shows, one sweet weekend. The 24th Annual Oregon Jamboree, presented by South Pacific Auto Sales, is bringing you the biggest show of 2016. Carrie Underwood. Toby Keith. Let's have a party. Randy House. Come on now. We're Old Dominion. Chase Bryant. And so many more. July 29th through the 31st. Tickets on sale now at OregonJamboree.com. Presented by South Pacific Auto Sales. William, it's a time for the Oregon Jamboree. Yeah, I could tell that from the cowboy hat. <laughs> you think? <laughs> it is time for the Oregon Jamboree happening in Sweet Home, Oregon at the end of July. And we have tickets to give away. And it's really easy. All you have to do is go to gardentime.tv, send us an email on why you like Garden Time television or why you like Garden Time magazine or both. And we'll pick the winners from those entries at the end of June. <laughs> Good luck, everyone, and yeehaw! In the summer months, water use can double or triple due to outdoor watering. Here are three simple tips to help save water and money this summer. Set your sprinklers so that they're watering your lawn and plants and not the pavement. Water early in the morning or later in the evening when temperatures are cooler. Group plants with similar water, shade, and sun needs together. For more water conservation information and tips, check out the Regional Water Providers Consortium at www.conserveh2o.org.
So I'm here with our good friend Greg from Zero Plants, and you might remember it was just a couple of weeks ago that we talked with Greg about specific plants for our area, and we're going to do that again, except we're going to do it right here in your yard, which is breathtaking. So let's start from the beginning, Greg. What was this when you took it over? It Because it wasn't this, was it? It was not this, you know. <laughs> this was a very traditional Portland-style garden, a lot of lawn in the front. Uh, there was a large street tree in place and a large group of foundation plantings of rhododendrons growing mm -hmm. around the house. It kind of blocked a lot of the windows. Um, so not a lot of diversity going on here. So when I, being an avid gardener, I wanted to transform it into kind of a very lots going on kind of garden space. So um, obviously a lot of the lawn, shrubs, all that kind of stuff had, had to, to go. go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the street tree ended up having to come out because it was uh, almost completely rotten. Yeah. So that turned what was going to be a shade garden into a full sun garden. Um, and so in planning that, a lot of the plants that I grow at Zira are suited for, for full sun. So I kind of wanted to do an experimental garden um, to see what would grow, what would look great all year with um, little to no summer water. Because you really do, you are very good about thinking about the, the water that we use. Even though it seems like we have all the water in the world yeah. in this area, you're still very aware of that and all of these plants did that, didn't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, they've got to be able to take 40 inches of rain in three months, and then they've got to be able to go for six months, as has been the case lately, without any water. So um, everything here was planted four years ago. Wow. Um, I, and it's full. And it's, I mean, it's, it's getting full, so yeah, we're going to see what happens in a couple of years. Um, but uh, what the first step I did was uh, getting rid of the lawn. I sheet mulched, which yeah. is layering cardboard and uh, some planting mix on top of the lawn to let it naturally die, decompose. Um, Everything here is planted in the native soil, um, so I didn't do any soil amending because I kind of wanted to see uh, how things would grow, what's really going to thrive with the native dirt we had as well as the native rainfall. Yeah, and then, you know, you're also, even though you are really conscientious about watering, you're still a believer that you come out here and pay attention to your garden, which is kind of key. Definitely, And yeah. still have to spot water once in a while. With There's a few things, especially things that I want to keep blooming through the summer um, that I'll come out and do a little bit of spot watering on. Uh, when putting in low water gardens, one of the things I like to start with is choosing your structural plants. So we've got some bigger manzanitas yeah. behind us, the red buds of the street trees, uh, picking structural plants that don't need any water at all so you can concentrate your efforts on some of the flowering perennials, that kind of thing. And that makes sense. Now, this is the front yard, but you've also got a really great backyard as well. Some temperature differences there, so let's walk back there and, and talk about that. Sounds good. So now, Greg, we are in the, the backyard here, and you kind of believe that there's really a difference sometimes, quite often in fact, between just the front and the back of a house. What are the differences here? Yeah, so in picking the plants to do back here, it's a lot more protected uh -huh. by the buildings. Um, it's a lot more shade cast by the patio here. Um, so the plants I chose back here are quite a bit different. The front yard's very exposed. This I've got a little bit more shade, and it's actually kind of challenging finding plants that can take that shade during the winter from the house, um, yeah, yeah. but then get a little more sun in the uh, summer. Um, I also wanted to do a vegetable garden back here. Sure. So there is a small vegetable garden, which is where I save a lot of my watering goes into the vegetables. Um, and also create kind of a nice secluded place to hang out on a sure. hot summer evening. It's a lot cooler back here. Well, and I noticed too that throughout the garden, I see, and even in your containers, you have a lot of like a pea gravel, a small gravel. And why do you do that versus regular bark dust? Well, one thing I've noticed in, in doing this low water garden is that the um, pea gravel insulates the soil better than mm -hmm. bark dust. I've used hemlock bark as, as a mulch. Uh, mulch in general is going to help conserve soil moisture sure. of any type, but the uh, gravel, uh, water does not evaporate as quickly out of the soil, so it actually retains the soil moisture a lot, more, a lot better than bark mulch does. Sure. Um, same thing goes for containers. So, and then also in the watering, it would, it, it, with the gravel, it would just go directly to the soil. It's not going to be soaked up by any exactly. of the covering. Exactly. Yeah, the gravel tends to break the surface tension of the soil. So when you're out doing your watering, um, it actually soaks into the soil. Because as you know, watering in the summer, it's always hard to tell, yeah. uh, am I actually doing any good here or watering this plant? <laughs> well, and being in the, in the horticulture industry, you know, you sell plants for a living, you grow plants for a living, and then you had to come, I'm sure you didn't want to come home and have to water at home too, exactly. so you've really created an entire garden that is very limited to its water use now. 
Definitely. And it's, it's an experimental garden, so there have been a few failures, but it's been yeah. interesting to find out, like, hey, this plant is a winner. So, Greg, a lot of these plants, uh, of course, can be purchased at zero, but you also have a great pamphlet that you have at the store. Yeah, it's called uh, Water Efficient Plants for the Willamette Valley, put out by the Regional Water Providers Consortium, and it's a great starting guide if you want to research some more about low water plants. So there you have it, my friends. So if you want more information on how you can conserve water and buy really water-wise plants, you can go to gardentime.tv and we can click you over to the Regional Water Providers Consortium website where you can download that same pamphlet right in the comfort of your own home and you can be smart about saving water in your own garden. Greg, thank you so much, my friend. Thanks so much, Morgan. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru. Your way on the parkway. Based on reviews, I found Capital. It was an excellent experience. I felt very comfortable, especially being a single woman. Kick off summer with a great deal from Capital. Lease the new 2016 Subaru Forester 2.5i CVT, the most award-winning small SUV, just $188 per month. Owned for just $23,438. When I hear stories from other people about car buying experiences, they're horror stories. And mine, I just left with a big smile, and I've been smiling ever since. I got it my way on the parkway. Since 1982, the wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, the wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Well, we all love to see new projects in the garden, and I'm at Anne's house. Hi, Anne. Hi. And you really came here just not even a year ago and did some major project, projects. I did. I did. And so what did you inherit when you first came? Um, basically, I inherited the footprint. Um, the house was built in 1925, and I was lucky enough to buy it from a family who'd lived here for 50 years. Oh, wow. So there were some things that needed to be upgraded and things that needed to be brought to code. And once we started, then it was just more things to be yeah, brought up to code. <laughs> and so we ended up taking it down really to the studs and the foundation and added four feet at the back and opened up an attic room and the living room and dining room and then we just kept going. Ah, and when you came out, actually because you pushed out the house, you had to change the backyard. So this really changed radically. Yes, it did. By the time they were finished with the construction on the house, this was kind of wall-to-wall -wall mud. Oh, and a slope. So right now you don't have a slope. You have a really great entertaining area. I do. I do. It's a great place for my grandchildren to come and play and my daughters to come and visit. And what were you hoping to accomplish with this landscape here? One of the homes where I felt most welcome, safest, happiest growing up was my grandparents' home. And what I really wanted to do was recreate that feeling. Not the house itself, but just recreate that feeling. Um, one of the things I was able to do was actually find something called Reseda odorata, which is mignonette that my grandmother grew and I have looked all over and finally found it at the Portland Nursery. Aww. So now I'm able to put it in pots. Ah. Well, I'm gonna to talk to David now, who, David, you really inherited a project too. I did. And so Ann says this was all mud back here, but you made it into a great space. Yeah, it was mud with a lot of weeds growing through it. Not a lot of good soil for growing anything, just a kind of useless space. And she wanted somewhere to entertain guests, like she said, her grandkids and her regular children and we did our best to provide the adequate space for that. Ah, and you really used a lot of different materials. I know the wall is really known for recycled, mm -hmm. using recycled materials, but you used a lot of different materials here. Right, I mean, you can see just by starting off, we've got the recycled concrete wall, kind of one of our claim to fames. And beyond that, it was pavers from Allen Block and recycled gravel and crushed rock and sand. And yeah. It all comes together quite nicely. It does, and I think all the textures really make it more interesting, and you even have like a slate area of, um, foot, of um, a footpath that goes mm -hmm. around the side of the house, and that right. adds another dimension to it. Absolutely, it gives access all throughout the property. Uh, that was actually performed by Larry Borland, landscape architect design. Um, he's the one who handed off the bid to me to get the project going back here. I put that together, and he followed me with this landscape working. And he had a great vision and put it all together. Him and Ann both together collaborated and 
even brought me into the picture with some additional features put into the wall itself and it all just came together perfectly. Yeah, it's really great. They have like a little letter box there, so I yeah. think the kids can put letters to the fairy garden. It's all over in the corner too. She handed me a wooden plaque full of doorknobs. <laughs> she asked me if I could plug those in there. As a surprise, I made a little face out of a few of those in the back oh, corner. Oh, that's great. Some, some for some additional fun to it, you know. She had that character to her. I thought she'd enjoy it. Well, that's part of the wall too. You really go above and beyond for your customers, for your yes. clients, really doing all Always those striking. special things. Yeah. And in the front, there's a beautiful rose garden. Yes. Now up front, before this project even began, I was doing a stone wall with mortar joints and she mentioned to me that she wanted a wall in the backyard as well. Um, I said, well, I'm looking forward to hearing from you again. She's a great person to work with, her and Larry both. And a couple months later, I got a design from Larry and Rick, the owner of the wall. Tell me I'm back at it again. I said, I can't wait to start. Oh, that's great. Well, you really, you could see that it's a lovely project, a re really lovely landscape that came together here for the homeowner and um, for her friends and family. So if you have any questions about the wall, you can go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website. You can see all the beautiful pictures that they can maybe make into a reality at your house. Thanks so much. Thank you. So I'm standing out at the beautiful Heirloom Roses Display Gardens and I'm here with Ben. And Ben, today we're going to just talk about, there's just a few things that you suggest doing for summertime care of roses. What are those? Sure. Now, right now, we, you can see we have a beautiful display of color. Yeah. Everything's just popped. And we're kind of into the time of year when we start to get spent blooms. Okay. And so you don't have to deadhead your roses but it's better to deadhead your roses. You'll get more blooms throughout the summer. Okay. And so what we tell people is to come back in and take them down to a leaflet of five. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't go to a leaflet, of, a leaflet of five has a bud in there and it will begin growing again. Okay. And what we tell people is it's 60 days from prune to bloom. So it'll be 60 days from the time I cut that to the time you'll get another set of blooms on that. Nice. nice. So you can deadhead your rose all at once and then you'll be without blooms for 60 days or you can do it ever so often and you'll have blooms yeah, throughout the summer. Not all of them need to be deadheaded right now so that's perfect. You could really have a lot more blooms more often. Sure and also if you have some harsh weather either really hot or some rain coming um, you can come in here and just take roses inside. Oh, Don't okay. wait to deadhead, just enjoy them inside. And then, because yeah, that makes perfect sense. And what else would you have to do in the summertime? Yeah, so uh, certainly in Oregon here, the most important thing is we get a lot of rain in the spring, yep. but throughout the summer, it's very dry. And so you, your, your rose is gonna need three inches of water per week. Okay. And it's best if you don't do that all at once. So I would say twice a week, one to two inches of water uh, to, to really soak it and do it well. And I've heard a lot about never watering roses on top. Is that something that you guys do? Well, too? here in the gardens, actually, we, we overhead irrigate because uh -huh. that's what's been in place. Uh, the important thing, though, is to make sure the foliage dries off. Okay. So if you're overhead irrigating, make sure you do it early in the morning and make sure the sun cooks it off and you should be fine. Okay. And yeah. what else should we be doing then? Well, you have these beautiful blooms. This amazing grace here is just showing off beautifully, but it took a lot of energy to produce that bloom. Right. And you need to really replenish that for the rose. So I would come back in here once every six weeks with fertilizer. And a granular fertilizer on established roses is great. About a quarter cup of triple 16. That's so a well-balanced. That general purpose one? Oh, just that's a well-balanced formula and that works really well. Um, and yeah, you get your, keep your rose going. They, they, they take a lot of energy to keep these blooms yeah, going. Yeah, they do. So we've got pruning, water, and fertilizer. What else do you have in mind? Yeah, so if you get in with a little disease problem, um, some black spot here or there you'll start to see, um, we would recommend coming in and um, doing a gentle, uh, a gentle spray, either an organic or a non-organic spray, okay. just for a fungus type thing, uh, on a regular basis to keep that those those black spots down. So, do you think that you should, when you see it though, can you start early so you don't have to ever get it? Do you think that, or just wait till you see it and then do it? Well, the best an ounce of prevention is worth yeah, a pound true. of cure, right? Okay. So, it's much better to start in the early spring and just just you know we just talked talked about neem oil, something like that, to yeah. really just kind of keep things at bay. And you won't have problems the rest of the summer. Well, there you have it. Now, I'm going to believe that all of you have been out here to Heirloom Roses. If you haven't, you certainly have to put it on your to-do list because it is breathtaking. If you love roses, they are everywhere. You can buy them. You can get the information about them. You can even order them online. So for more information, go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to the Heirloom Roses website. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. Welcome to Drake's, not your ordinary garden center. Grab a cup of coffee at Antonio's and wander the nursery for the perfect plant. Check out the landscape design showrooms for ideas, then meet with a designer. 
come pick out a bouquet of flowers for dinner or for that someone special. Find something distinctive for your home or your garden. Imagine the possibilities and let Drake's turn them into realities. Drake's 70s on Southwest Shoals Ferry Road in Portland. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook too. Create this year's containers and baskets with black gold natural and organic potting soil. Don't trust your edibles and flowers with a potting soil labeled organic. Look for the OMRI listed logo on black gold natural and organic potting soil to be sure it truly is organic. Look for earthworm enriched black gold at your local garden center or go online to blackgold.bz. Black gold, all the riches of the earth. Well, I am here with my good friend Donna Wright from SunGrow, who is the maker of Black Gold products. Mm -hmm. And Donna, we are going to be making Hypertufa. But before we get into the mix of it, tell us a little bit, what is it and, and why should we even want to make one? Well, Hypertufa is a lightweight concrete planter. It really is. Yeah. I mean, it's very light. Yeah. It's fun to make, easy to do. So what we, all we need is three things and some water, peat, perlite, and Portland cement. And so, and, it, and it's an easy mix to it's make. So mix. let's walk over yep. here to our... Our mixer, which is really a Our wheelbarrow. Our mixer, yep. <laughs> now, how much of this do we have in here? Now, we have uh, peat, perlite, and Portland cement, so it's one, two, one. So what we've done is filled up one of these with pe uh, peat, uh -huh. two of them with perlite, and then we do one Portland cement. Okay. So that's your formula, the ones we're going to do today. I'm going to go ahead and crack You're this You're going to crack that open. So what we've done is already mix the dry ingredients. And this, you can get this at any hardware store. Yeah, a's, make sure it's Portland Depot. cement. Yeah. Feel the consistency. Yeah. See, it's There's like, no gravel. It's, it's like a cornstarch almost. Yeah. Yep. So one of so these, the did brand. you say? Mm -hmm. Okay, and just spread it in here. And then we're going to do one more. Yep. So rip this a little bit more. There we go. So you can make a little batch or a big batch. Just remember one, two, one. One, two, one. And mm -hmm. then you can really, it's easy to adjust if you get a little yes, loft. Yes, it too. is. Okay. So now some of these, like this one, William, we'd put colorant in it. It's concrete colorant. Mm -hmm. It's in the powdered form. And you buy it at the, on the hardware store. It's concrete colorant. Um, they use in like mortars. So yeah. this one here is particularly red and there's tan, brown, black and every. And that's when you'd put it in if you were going to do a right, color. Right at this step. If you right, want the gray though, that's right fine now. too. So what we want to do is we want to mix this in really well and make sure that we can't see any more of the cement. This out of the way. So you're just tossing it around like sugar and flour. Yep. <laughs> How does that look? Yep. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a kind of a well in the middle, like if when you're baking you do a well, and then we're going to start adding water into that. And then how much water do you add? Is you it just, just a we're gonna add thing? A, we're going to add and then stir, add and stir. It's to a cottage cheesy uh, consistency. Okay. If you hold it into a ball, then it will it stick together, and then it's ready to, ready to go. So now, Donna, this looks pretty cottage cheesy to me. It looks good. And, and may I say, this is why you want to wear gloves, because it, it really is messy. <laughs> Defin definitely. So sticking together really well like yep. that. Yep. And now we're ready to go ahead and put it in our form. OK, now what, what is that? What do we do to get okay, ready OK, well, that? we can use any kind of a container, a empty box, as like old pots or whatever. And what we need to do is line it. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what I usually use is like an old tablecloth, a garbage bag, anything like that, any kind of plastic that's going to keep it from uh, sticking to the sides and in five to seven days you'll be able to pop this right out and dry it, continue drying it. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start filling these up. And is there, do you just pretty much go by like 
how do you know how when it's full? Yep. Well, and you want to make sure that your sides and your bottom are about a quarter inch thick. This one now. You go ahead. Just form it with your fingers along, and that's another reason you have these gloves. You can make fancy decorations at the top, or you can leave it plain. Lots of times I can just fold the plastic over the top to finish the edge if you want. Well, and the fun thing too is you can make them as tall or as short as you want. That's right. And while you're molding them, you can make them as rough or as smooth. That's right. And what about putting like things on the side, like stones or leaves or stuff? Get yeah. moss, can you put that in? Yep, you put green moss on the inside of that plastic and push this right against it. Cool. It makes a beautiful finish. Now, I would assume once all this is done, you want to put the hole in before you start right. letting it dry. So now look at mine. It's all ready. Yours looks much smoother than mine does. <laughs> if it's in practice. So what I do is I'm just going to go ahead and pop my finger right there in the, like that. Uh -huh. And after five days, seven days, I'm going to pop it out of here. It's going to come right out. I'm going to continue drying it. And then another two weeks, it would be ready to plant up. And then you come up with something just like this. Right. If the, if the hole fills in, all you can do is take a little drill and drill right through. That one's got a hole in it, ready yeah. to plant. Wonderful. Well, you know, it's an easy, easy recipe, and it's a lot of fun. It's great for kids. It's a, it's a good family thing to get out there, and, and it's really a fun project to create something for your own patio, for your own yard, and then have the fun planting mm -hmm. it up. And you can do so many different kinds of shapes. It's yeah. It's really up to your imagination. Up to your imagination. Well, for more information on the recipe and information on how to make these, you can go to gardentime.tv. Donna, always a pleasure and a lot of fun. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you. At Garland Nursery, you'll find top quality plants, four generations of garden know how, fun and fantastic garden decor and the best in garden supplies. Come visit us at Garland Nursery. Since 1937, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils and bark dust, choose Grimm's. U-Haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. Bees and pollinators are always in the news and it's always good to be good stewards to those. And I'm with Gail today and Gail, you know, we, we really want to help um, bees because they're really so important to us and we're at a really special place at OSU today. Absolutely. We are at the Oak Creek Center for Urban Horticulture on the campus of Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. And then really, what do you do for OSU? Because we should say that too. Sure. So I'm an associate professor at um, Oregon State in the Horticulture Department and I also coordinate the statewide Master Gardener program. Yeah, so we've talked to you before about lots of things and spiders was a good one and, mm -hmm. and so and bees is another good subject and so what can we do to to really help them in our gardens and really help the whole community of bees. Right. Well, it's fabulous that uh, we're talking to gardeners because one of the best things that you can do to help out bees in urban and suburban areas is simply to plant flowering plants. Um, the research that we do in my laboratory, we've tried to understand those things that gardeners do that um, promote and encourage bees or that discourage bees from being in your garden. And the number one thing we found that gardeners do that promote bees is simply the amount of flowering plants that they have in their garden. 
we can do that. I mean, we all love to do that. And really that's, you don't think that it's a bigger scale than that. It's like we do it because we enjoy it, but really we help them too. Absolutely. Yeah, we actually even looked at the amount of green space that was surrounding individual gardens to try to see if landscape level green space impacted bee biodiversity. Um, but it really had a minor effect compared to the influence of flowering plants alone. And of course, I have to say that if you're interested in protecting bees in your garden or encouraging bees in your garden, then you really should look to reduce or eliminate your use of broad spectrum insecticides. Yeah, and that brings up that whole story about um, the bee colony collapse. Sure. So we haven't really heard about that in the news lately. So right. what is really going on with that? Yeah, so colony collapse disorder um, hit the news big time in 2007 when honey beekeepers started noticing um, almost overnight a lot of losses from their hives. And uh, folks have been studying for many years why that seemed to have been happening. It seems like there are several things that might have been contributing. Um, but we really haven't seen those large-scale bee losses in the same way that we did in 2007. So colony collapse disorder doesn't seem to be as big of an issue today as it was about a decade ago. Well, I think we all learned a lot from it. And so really, if we've helped a little bit or whatever happened, I think we've all learned that maybe pesticide use has to go down. So I think that's really what's the good Absolutely. that came out. Absolutely. And it definitely put a highlight on how important bees are to our natural areas that we love, to our gardens that we love, to the food that we love to eat. They really play an important role in our lives. It probably was overlooked and undervalued before colony collapse disorder hit the news. Mm. And so besides those two things, and then what else can we do to help bees in our gardens? Yeah, so um, a lot of people really like bee blocks as a way to <laughs> encourage bees in their yard. And bee blocks are great. They provide great habitat for cavity nesting bees. But of all the bee species that there are, only about 30% nest in cavities. The other 70% nest in the ground. Oh, so wow. if you might be open to tolerating a little bit of bare ground in your yard, <laughs> not over mulching every area, not over planting. That can be really great for encourages, encouraging ground nesting bees in a garden. Oh, that is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then what about water? So water is fantastic as well. You know, bees are animals and all animals need water. So making sure that they have a water source, whether it's just a bee bath or whether it's access to a nearby pond or um, just any access to water that bees can use will help them as well. Yeah. Well, you know, Gail always gives us such good information. So um, remember all those different points. And if you have any other questions, go to gardentime.tv. We'll click it over to OSU. They have lots of bulletins on bees and pollinators and get more information that you can use for your garden. Gail, thanks so much. Thank you so much. You know, we wanted to give you some simple ideas and tips on making trellises because so many things in a garden, mm -hmm. vine, and whether you're talking about vegetables or some, you know, just some beautiful oh, flowering sure. stuff, you really want to make some nice uh, trellises. So here we have an idea with bamboo. Right, you know, I just found these in my shed, and so I just took them together and I found it a huge twist tie and just gathered them at the top and I'll just drive them into the ground for some more support. I can use this for peas or beans or even ornamental vines for the summertime. And it's really very simple to do. You just get you three go. things, and it doesn't have to be bamboo. You can use pieces of iron, you can use small pieces of wood, anything sure. that you might have laying around. You just take some stretch tape and you tie them up. And then all you do is just spread them out. And it's just that simple. That is good. Well, you know, we all have tomato cages. This is a great square one. You don't have to just use them for tomatoes. We've used these for peas, and what's a great idea is to plant the peas on the inside, and then they'll wind their way up. You don't plant the peas on the outside because if you need to hoe around it or weed around it, you can actually mm -hmm. take the plants out. So this way, the plants are protected on the inside of the trellis. Here's another great idea that's very cost effective for the garden. It's just trellises made with PVC. You get some PVC, you get some uh, T connectors and some corners. The great thing about this idea is you can cut them to any height you want, any width you want, and look at that, they still move. So in the winter time, if you're not using them, just fold them Perfect. up, put them in the, the garage or in your shed, and then you string them with just some simple string or twine or even hemp and it works great. And you can make different sizes, Judy. Yeah, look at this one. It's just a shorter version of yours. It's just for some cucumbers that aren't going to get as tall as the beans. Mm -hmm. So it's really effective that way. Now we've got one more thing mm -hmm. we want to show you. Let's go to another place in the garden. 
William, this is a great idea. If you have an existing fence, these are fence posts that are already in for this really long fence trellis system. And all we did was put some eye hooks in here and they're stainless or they're galvanized so they're not going to rust. And you know, all we did here was use some fishing wire. Now some people don't want to use fishing wire because they say it doesn't biodegrade. That's fine. You can still use twine or string or hemp again just to string it up and then it gives your vines a really great place to grow. You know, everybody is looking to add some verticality into their garden. These are four simple ways to make trellises to make your garden more beautiful. Damien, fancy meeting you here at Standard TV and Appliance. I had no idea they sold mattresses. Why, certainly they do. As a matter of fact, they have the largest selection of beauty rest mattresses in the entire state. Huge price gets now on Standard's all-star lineup of mattresses, including Beautyrest Black. I'm going to sleep great tonight. A hometown favorite since 1947 for appliances, TVs, and mattresses. You got it. Standard TV and appliance. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. I am at the J. Frank Schmidt Arboretum in Boring with Nancy Bewley. And Nancy, this is like a wonderland display garden. It is. It's 10 acres. We have about 500 trees here. And it's basically our showroom floor <laughs> for our entire product line right here where you can see it growing. Uh, well, we're talking today about trees that maybe have more than one season of interest, which we really think that when you're choosing a tree, it's going to be with you a long time. You should look beyond the bloom. I mean, this is spectacular, mm -hmm. but it has more attributes. Yeah. So what's this one? Well, this is a new snowbell, Styrax japonicus, and unlike all the other snowbells, it has a dark, kind of a purple Sorry. leaf, and this will get darker as the time goes on, as the, as the heat comes on, and so it's just a really, it has really nice foliage all season and long. Yeah, but the flowers are cool, the texture is cool, and then even in the winter time, the branching structure mm -hmm. is really yeah, neat. It's really refined, and, and this one is more upright than most Styrax too, so it would fit in a smallish garden where you don't have as much space. Ah, oh, that is true, and our lots are getting a lot mm -hmm. narrower, so mm -hmm. really a good one for that, that new house that's on the market right. now. Yeah. And you have some other ones that we're going to go see, so let's go over to those okay. and try them out. All right. Nancy, now these are parodia, which you don't see on the market or people's yards too much. So how are these two different? They look very similar. Well, parodia, the seedling parodias are really generally quite rounded and um, big statured trees. These selections, there are two that are both upright and vase shaped. This one is named Ruby Vase. And as you can see, it has very upright branching. Mm -hmm. And then this one is Vanessa. And um, this one is really getting out in the marketplace quite a bit. It has very nice foliage, Pretty. Uh, red in the spring, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see it has red tips. Very uh, nice. matures. And then there's another one on the market that's just pretty brand new, so it'll be hard to find. But this one is called Persian Spire. Oh, look at that. And this one was discovered by a, a nurseryman down in Salem, so oh, it's really homegrown. It is. And um, it is really remarkable for the, the red. Very it nice. starts out quite red, and then it'll keep this red edge for quite a while. And this shape is really unique. It's columnar, mm -hmm. and it is really, it's very vigorous, but it's very compact, and it's going to be a great tree for small properties. Again, for that, that new garden that's with us all, right. that small gardens. Yeah. And you have one more special area we're going to go to, we're so let's go, go over look there. At some dogwoods. All right. Beautiful dogwoods and variegated for later in the season. Really right. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, this is a new variegated dogwood. It's called Summer Gold and it has really rich foliage. So um, it's, and I like the way that the flowers stand up on it and it, it doesn't scorch and it's just a really nice one. And when the flowers are gone, you've got this great 
great color the rest of summer and then the fall colors are spectacular there's there are two colors of oh. kind of pink and magenta very nice oh wow and then right across the road here are two other ones that mm -hmm. are cream and green right yeah the one on the left is summer fun which is kind of like summer gold only uh -huh. summer fun and then the <laughs> other one to the right is samaritan and it's been on the market longer you can see that it's a little wider summer fun is is uh, a little more narrow but they're both they, they really brighten up see against that darker against the evergreens or against the darker they're just really quite spectacular all season long ah really nice nancy has given us a few ideas for some interesting trees for our gardens our front yards our backyards so go to your independent garden centers and see what you can find to add to that garden thanks so much all right thank you judy I'm at French Prairie Perennials in Aurora with Carrie. And Carrie, you know, we come and we speak with your husband, Rick, about plants. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's other things to gardens besides plants. There's accessories. Right. So what do you think about wind chimes? You really have a great selection here. Well, thank you. I think we do. Um, I personally like soft wind chimes. I find uh, really loud ones kind of annoying. <laughs> but um, I think not only should you have something for sound, but also for movement in the garden. Um, I think that uh, while plants are lovely, mm -hmm. it's always nice to have a little bling, a little bit of something with texture, a little bit of motion Definitely. Um, to keep it interest. And I like this one because it's that ceramic sound. It's different than a jingling bells. Mm -hmm. So really something for everyone. And I think, I know it must drive you guys crazy when people have to go and shake them all, but really you want something that fits your personality in your garden. Absolutely. That's important to us that everybody feels like they have something unique and that suits them. Ah, that is nice. Well, you have so many things in this gift shop, but let's go <laughs> over and talk about rain chains. All right, sounds good. Carrie, you really have a nice selection of rain chains. It's something maybe people don't uh, think about, you know, adding to their house or for um, something pretty. And this one even has bells. So that's kind of unique. Yeah, I think it's really important, like I said before, to have unusual elements in the garden. Um, not everybody has maybe a large yard, but can certainly enjoy a patio or deck decoration. Yeah, that is nice. And this one, the, the cups is kind of more traditional, and then the bells is a little bit different, but I really like this one because it's like movable sculpture. Yeah, this is our number one seller. Very and um, this one not only does the water cause it to spin, as obviously um, it's going downhill from the gutter, but it just has a lot of visual appeal. It has a lot of modern look to it, and, and people enjoy that. It does. And so maybe you can give us a little bit of a tips on how to install it, because I'm thinking I need to hire somebody, but maybe not. No, they're quite easy. Um, you do have to um, disconnect the downspout mm -hmm. and you would insert this piece, thank you, uh -huh. into the oh, actual downspout easy. and connect it to that piece up there. And then once it's connected, there's an, another piece just like this at the base that you can ah. connect to a basin like this. Some people just connect it onto the basin um, so that it doesn't blow in the wind. And then okay. some people actually set the basin down into a decorative um, container and so they hide that portion. Very nice, really. And that's that's what makes it so much easier because then you don't have to hire someone, which right. is lovely. Right. And then maybe we have maybe a more beach kind of theme or something yeah. more rustic and you have some things made with um, driftwood. Those are beautiful. Yes, we do. Um, very popular is our beach decor right now. And um, sometimes we have ones that have shelves intermittent spread throughout. Um, but it's really lovely if you want to transform your space into having a more summery, yeah. beachy feel. Why not? Why yeah. not? And then you do need somewhere to sit down. Absolutely. <laughs> so you need to take a look at maybe some benches. Yeah, and really a nice assortment. And the one with the flag, really getting ready for 4th of July would be great. Yeah. We have some other um, items that will be coming in also that can help decorate your exterior that has to do with the American flag. And why not celebrate the old, good old USA? Definitely, definitely. So you have to come out to the new store in Aurora and come out to French Prairie Perennials and see all the beautiful plants outside, but all the great gifts and garden accessories inside. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Judy and I are out here at Zanger Farm, which is an urban educational farm, and we're going to be talking about pinching back basil. You know, this time of year your basil is doing really great, but you want to pinch it to prevent it from going to flower and to incre increase production. So just go in and you just pinch out the leaves at the top of each stem and it'll flush out new growth for the rest of the season and prevent it from flowering. Pinching back basil for better production, that's our tip of the week.
Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Do you want to be green? Do the easy stuff first. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. The U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee says for every dollar spent on a shade tree, you can save $5 on cooling, blocking the penetrating heat in the summer and allowing the warm rays through in the winter. Dollar for dollar, there's no better energy and money saver than a good, deciduous shade tree. Portland Nursery's professionals can help you make the perfect selection. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook too. I am standing in a beautiful garden and I am with Nancy and Carol and we are going to be doing some leaf casting today and they're going to give us some real steps on how to do this really well. Now we're going to talk with Carol a little bit later on but right now Nancy I would like to know what would be the first step? I would assume it would be how to choose a leaf and which ones to choose. Exactly. You're going to want something that has very very prominent vein structure. Vein okay. structure and texture on the, of the leaf make for a beautiful casting. Okay. You want something fairly sturdy. So if the leaf is too soft, when you're applying the cement that you'll see later with Carol, it may split. So you want a very, very sturdy leaf. The ones that we have found that work the best are the hosta, sure. hydrangea leaves, red bud leaves. They're some of the ones that you're going to find your best result with. So yeah. now what are the supplies needed? To do this project. Well, what you're gonna, what we found is works really, really well, is a um, vinyl concrete patch, and it comes in 40-pound bags, so it's really doable in terms of going to Home Depot or Lowe's and getting it and carrying it. And what I found is, if you have a little kit available, and then you can have things all the way that you would use from finishing, which might be sandpaper, little pliers, um, a brush to brush away the dust. We take, if there's a hole in the leaf, we patch it with a little bit of duct tape oh, okay. on the right side of the surface. Carol can show you that later. But then it keeps the cement from coming through. There's just a whole lot of different tools that, that you can utilize once the product mm -hmm. is almost finished to either make it smoother or to add stuff to it. And that was one of, one of my questions, because you said you didn't want to do a flat surface, and then I see this little setup of saucers here, and you mentioned mounding. I would think then that that has to be, you have to have a form for the leaf to set on. How, what would you do to do that? Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk about mounding, because this is a good point to do that. So if you want to lift up I that... Will. Dirt. And it, it looks <laughs> it like dirt. It is dirt, dirt yeah. <laughs> so the, the thing that we have found is like small nursery boxes work well. You, you want to be able to transport the leaf from one point to sure. another. You want a sturdy box. But what you would do here in, is, and this and is... What is that exactly? This is, this is just old mulch that I have used actually from last year, and I took one of my old mounds apart. And what you want, because you're going to be slapping that concrete about uh -huh. that hard, you want the mound to be equally as hard. Okay, that makes sense. So that it supports the structure sure. of the leaf. So if I say, gee, I want a really deep leaf for a bird bath, then I um, just pretend this is all done because we'll show okay. you a finished one in a moment. And then you're going to take your So you have plastic. to cover that, don't you? Yeah. Okay. It, you don't have to, but it makes for a nicer leaf. Okay. And it, and it contains everything very well. And then you can see how nicely that leaf fits yep. over the top. All right. Well... But, now that we've got those steps done, now we're going to start and join Carol and look at the next steps in this process. Okay, now I'm here with Carol, and Carol, what would be the next step in this process? Well, now that we have this fabulous mold that is very sturdy and much like the shape of the leaf that we're yeah. going to use, um, I'll decide, you know, sort of get the leaf positioned and make sure the mold is good. I like the leaf that okay. way. So what is the mixture of concrete? How do, what's the way to do that? Well, this is the vinyl patch concrete and I've got one container and that should be enough 
Um, the trick is to add the water very slowly. Okay. And be sort of conscious of what's going on here. The goal is to have this mix be stiff enough that it will not slide around and sure. we want to be able to control it. So we start in the middle with a wad of concrete and pat hard. So I'm moving toward the edges and I'll never go beyond them because if I go beyond the edge I won't know where the edge is. Oh, okay. And um, and that would make it very difficult to take the leaf out, I would think, too. Right, and it wouldn't be um, sturdy there on the edge. If the edges are too thin, they break really easily. So now, is that one basically molded now? Yes, this one is finished. It is ready to sit now for probably 12 hours okay. overnight. And in the morning will be the finishing process, right? right? So now why don't we take a quick break, we'll run inside okay. and look at some of the finished items and what we have to do to complete the project. Great. So now we are standing at what we're going to call the finishing room and what would be the next step we do? We should peel and reveal. Okay, let's do that. So I'm going to set this down and let's turn these over and all we do is peel the leaves off We now. just peel the leaf off and reveal the lovely leaf below and what you'll see is sometimes they come off in one pull and sometimes it takes a couple. Okay, somehow I I, I feel like I got the short end of the leaf here. No, you, you <laughs> got the Did best I? <laughs> leaf. You got the very best leaf. Now what do I do with this stem that seems to be stuck in here? Pull, oh wait, I'm just going to... Pull harder. Oh look at that. You're, oh, you're look a at tough that. guy. Look at that. And these we can just scrape off then? Good work. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a dental tool for and that. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, very seriously, when you have oh, you a leaf, do. especially rhubarb, because the veins are so deep, what you, a dental pick works absolutely wonderful to just take and pull all of, all of the little out of strings the out well, so you get a good finished product. And Carol, what other tools then would you use to, to do some finishing work? Well, sometimes the edges are just a little bit rough, yeah. so we use a sanding block and oh. just sand that concrete. And that really is simple, isn't it? Really simple. If there's a um, uh, <clears throat> particularly nasty little piece, you just can just crunch it off with needle nose pliers. And and then once all of this this and I'm a, there's I don't see any kind of things put on this like a sealer. You guys don't put sealers on them, do you? No, we don't. Okay. Once in a while, we might paint them yeah. with an acrylic paint, really a uh, light wash. But we like the natural look because it looks beautiful. so beautiful with stone in the garden. Well, I have to say, this has been a delight this morning. We've had a lot of fun making these. And once you see them created, and you know you've had a hand in it, it really helps you put a, part of, a whole different part of you into your own garden. For more information on how you can actually get the steps, you can go to gardentime.tv and then start making some of your own leaf castings for your own space. Carol, Nancy, this has been a blast. Thank you Thank both you. so it's much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for watching Garden Time today, and we wanted to thank Drake's 7Ds for letting us spend some time here. And earlier we were talking about great inside plants that also do well on the patio, but Drake's also has a great selection of outdoor plants as well. For any other questions about today's show, please go to GardenTime.tv. And William and I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.